It is estimated that one out of six women experience sexual violence. One out of four experience domestic violence. If you are a woman with a disability, you are four to 10 times more likely than the general population to experience sexual and or domestic violence. I know because my husband abused me. And as a woman with a disability, I went to a shelter for help. And having that safe place to go to when I needed it saved my life. Unfortunately, persons with disabilities are disproportionately victims of physical abuse and of rape. Sexual assault and victim services staff need to be open to serving people with disabilities. They knew what to do on the sexual abuse side, but on the disability side, they told us they had no idea what to do. Many deaf women who have experienced sexual or domestic violence would not call for services out of past experiences, frustration. In this type of field, you're not working with just one type of population. You're working with various different people coming from various different walks of life. So in order to help everyone, you need to be educated and be very well-rounded. We can teach them. We can show them. We can help them to learn more about us and to know who we are. It's really critical that our community knows that we serve all people. I believe the shelter saved my life, so I know how important the work that they do is to women with disabilities. Having a, that safe place is, I, I really didn't realize that there was that kind of help out there. And then I started seeing these ads on television about shelters and it's not your fault and things that encouraged me to seek out help. And then having the courage to go to them and they accommodated me, helped me through the process and they helped me to understand things. When I left my husband, I had clothes on my back and that's it. The toiletries, nothing, not even money. So the shelter keeps an accumulation of clothes that have been donated. And then the person is to go to that pile of clothes and try to pick out things that will fit them and their children. Except in the shelter, it's usually up on a high floor like the attic or a second or third story and I couldn't do that. And there were so many clubs up there that they couldn't just bring them down to me to show them. So they have to change their practices about where they keep those kind of things for all the people in the shelter to be able to access. The other thing is the staff, I think, were probably the biggest. Because they didn't understand disability issues, they didn't know quite what to do with me, I think. The staff needs to have more exposure to people with disabilities. They have to feel more comfortable around people with disabilities so that they know how to also make them feel safe. Hi, can I help you? Folks in the sexual assault and victim services systems need to make sure that their facilities are physically accessible. Uh, they need to make sure that they're programmatically accessible communication-wise accessible. And there are all kinds of people with disabilities. There are people with mental health disabilities, people with intellectual disabilities, sensory disabilities, which includes not being able to hear so well or not being able to see so good. So the systems and the people need to be open and trained on disability issues and they need to be proactive about it, not reactive. Printed information, in my case, doesn't help very much. But that, again, stresses a need to make sure that information is available in a form that's usable and functional for the folks they're trying to serve. For instance, people with intellectual disabilities may not be able to understand really complex sentences. And so the, the language of any printed information needs to be at a level that's understandable by the users. Printed material for people whose first language isn't English, like people who are deaf, use American Sign Language, and ASL is not the same as English. People who are blind aren't going to be able to deal with printed material. They're going to need alternative formats, and not everybody who's blind reads Braille. People who are blind often use electronic formats to read material. They have screen readers that can process that information, or even people with limited vision use screen magnifiers. So it's really important to use material that there's a good contrast 
Every individual is different. So you can have general preparation around disabilities, but it will take patience and time and direct communication in order to figure out how best to accommodate each individual. YWCA, this is Rita speaking. How may I help you? Here at the YWCA, our mission is to help eliminate racism, empower women. We strive to do so by treating all clients, whether male, female, disability, non-disability. In order to have a welcoming environment, the overall attitude of staff is very important that we're making everyone, all our clients and consumers feel at ease, whether they're coming in for shelter or for counseling. We want to make everyone feel that they are being treated with the same respect. Also, it's very important for all of our staff to have insight on different issues and different barriers that may arise for individuals with disabilities. In some facilities, what may be safety precautions can also be a hindrance. We have to have all locked doors so perpetrators are unable to enter, but then we can't have automatic doors. We also want to remember to treat everything on a case-by-case -case basis, make the proper accommodations. We do have counseling rooms up on the third floor, but however, if someone comes in for counseling and they're unable to walk, we don't want to make them go up to the third floor, maybe meet them in the closest room possible. So just striving to fix services based on your client's needs. Disability Rights Network of Pennsylvania is the governor-designated protection and advocacy system for people with disabilities. We do a variety of things, including advocating against a discrimination under the Americans with Disabilities Act and other acts which prohibit discrimination against people with disabilities. Uh, we also focus on issues of abuse and neglect, uh, access to services, and it's particularly important that agencies which support people with disabilities are aware of the other resources in Pennsylvania, such as the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape and the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence to assist people who are victims of violence or rape. There are really two barriers to people with disabilities accessing uh, services for domestic and violence and rape. Um, first of all, they have to know about them. But even when they know about them, there, there are two types of barriers. One is physical barriers, that people with disabilities may need an architecturally accessible location, a person who's blind may need braille or other kinds of support, a person who's deaf may need an interpreter or other kinds of services. Another barrier is just transportation people with disabilities often have great difficulties in getting from one place to another just because transportation systems are not all accessible and for the most part domestic violence and rape crisis services are available at sites where you go to them. Another major obstacle for people with disabilities is the police. They're often unaware of how to respond to people with disabilities. Uh, people may have significant speech impairments, they may have cognitive impairments, and all of these things make it more difficult for the police to counsel and direct uh, the person who may have been a victim of crime. Uh, There's a very interesting case about two years ago in Philadelphia where a woman was a victim of sexual abuse and she had a very significant speech impairment. She had no cognitive impairment but she was very, very difficult to understand. The court did something very unusual. He let her speech therapist come in and interpret for her. The speech therapist simply repeated what she said because the speech therapist who was used to her and used to how she spoke was able to, to translate essentially for the court. But it's a type of translation we normally don't think of. And courts are another obstacle to people with disabilities getting uh, justice, uh, if you will, when they are victims of crime. Because again, there needs to be that extra uh, measure of reaching out to the person with disability, whether it's translation, whether it's accommodation, uh, whether it's just slowing things down and providing a little bit more detail into how things are explained. It's important for any organization that serves people with disabilities in doing their budgets to think about that it costs more to serve people with disabilities. And it's important that agencies think about that in drafting their budgets, that they need to take this into account to make sure they're, they're allocating enough money to serve people with disabilities just like they serve people without disabilities. The Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape is the oldest anti-rape coalition in the country. We represent 51 rape crisis centers throughout the Commonwealth who provide crisis services and work to eliminate sexual violence and advocate for the rights and needs of victims. 
Some of the barriers to rape crisis centers may be that people with disabilities don't even know that we exist. They don't have access to information that would tell them about our services. And those that do know may not know that we are accessible and that we do provide services to disabilities or question the fact whether or not we know how to provide services to all people with all disabilities. I think we have to do a better job of working with organizations that serve people with disabilities. I think we have to reach out to those programs, let them know what services we have available, let them know what our limitations are. I think we have to offer to provide trainings, not only to the people that work in those organizations, but perhaps doing community programs where people with disabilities will begin to feel comfortable with who we are. We can talk about who we are and the kinds of services that we provide. We at PCAR have embraced the feminist philosophy that talks about the anti-oppression work and that if we're working to eliminate sexual violence, we also have to look at all forms of oppression and that would include ableism and uh, classism and I think that's really critical that we accept that and celebrate that, that that is our philosophy and that we have a responsibility to our community to provide services to all people. The Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence main purpose is to end both personal and institutional violence against victims of domestic violence and we do that both through prevention programs, uh, intervening with specific victims, and creating change, both social change and systems change. It is part of our mission through our network of 60 programs to serve all victims. And although we know a great deal about serving different people from different backgrounds, we may not have the specific knowledge to serve persons with disabilities well. We are very good at crisis intervention. We may not have some of the specific accommodations available when someone who is deaf in particular would come to our programs. We then have to scramble and that may not be very welcoming to someone. There are a lot of myths about serving people with disabilities that may have to be overcome either on the part of staff or even on the victim uh, in terms of what domestic violence is or isn't. Uh, some of our buildings, especially our shelters, are older. They're often buildings that were given to the programs by a local community resource or um, wealthy person. And uh, although they've invested in trying to make them as accessible for persons with different physical capabilities, they may not be uh, up to par and, and as welcoming as we may need. Another thing is that it, not only do we want to make accommodations and be already set up in advance to support people and serve them well, we want to have, we want to have a diverse and inclusive staff, uh, board, volunteers, and make sure that we all have specific training, uh, both on domestic violence as well as the particular needs of the different communities that we serve. Sexual assault and domestic violence programs are not very well prepared to help deaf victims. Many of them have not actually experienced working with deaf clients in the past. They might be meeting a deaf person for the first time. Sometimes deaf callers are actually hung up on because the volunteers or staff receiving the call are not aware of how to receive a video relay call or receive a teletype call on a TTY. Volunteers and staff at sexual assault and domestic violence programs are often not well trained in working with people from the deaf community, not realizing there's a separate and distinct culture mm -hmm. in the deaf world. And instead of empowering the deaf person, they end up taking over mm -hmm. and, and not allowing the person to make decisions for themselves, instead sort of telling the person what to do. Many women don't feel comfortable going to services. They've tried in the past, been frustrated, and don't go back. For shelters to be barrier-free for deaf women, for them to feel safe and welcome in an environment, the shelter should have a flashing fire alarm system, flashing or vibrating wake-up alarm, a strobe light system uh, while for in the bedroom, 
to let them know that there's someone at the door wanting to speak to them, that kind of thing. Those would go a long way to creating a barrier-free environment. When a deaf woman stays in a shelter or a safe house, they're usually the only deaf woman in the house, and it's very common to feel isolated as the only person in the entire building who's deaf. Shelters should provide interpreters for communication with the other women in the shelter and the staff. Hello, speaking for self, good evening. The sexual assault folks, the sexual abuse folks, what we found out is that they didn't know anything about our system, nothing. They had a person with a disability that was sexual abuse. They knew what to do on the sexual abuse side, but on the disability side, for this person, they told us they had no idea what to do. And that's why Speaking for Herself is around, to help professionals to understand people with disabilities, to bring you at the table and say, this is who we are and what we are. I don't want to go back home to that. What are you going to do to save me? How can I get out? It's going to be very hard for the sexual assault and the sexual abuse to really understand people with disabilities unless you be around folks with disabilities, unless we do the training, speaking for ourselves, because we know our disability, we can teach them what we need and how to do it and how we want to be treated. Only the person with a disability can show how to do it. That's what each one teach one. That's one of our biggest models. I was prepared to move to another state and get a secret identity until I found out that I could get in the shelter and that it was okay. In order to help everyone, you need to be educated and be very well-rounded. Be prepared to deal with those issues when they come up and help individuals get the services that others who don't have disabilities have access to. Our core values say that we have to identify those barriers and do everything we can to eliminate them. Our mission is both domestic violence related, but also in terms of our social change work anti-oppression related and serving people with disabilities and deaf persons furthers both of those goals. I think what we're seeing is a change where these, these programs are becoming much more welcoming to people with disabilities. We not only have an obligation to do this, a responsibility to do this, but I know that our programs have a desire to do this.